morning youtubers so if you were with us for the first episode we talked about why are we going to repot when are we going to repot especially for our temperate species in our temperate climates um, i do fully recommend you watch that video we're trying to do a linear approach put some of these techniques together in first a lecture format before we start to work with the trees and apply it so for the second episode today we want to talk about now our soil choices when we're going to be a approaching that spring repotting season. So when we're talking about what we're going to use as a soil or a substrate, when we are getting into um, doing the actual repot, we need to remember what do we need for root health. And that root health is going to dictate the health up and throughout our tree and what kind of growth and vigor we can create in that tree. Um, so revisiting that again, what are the two components that we need for healthy roots in our bonsai? the balance of oxygen and the balance of water. Now, there's a lot of microbiology aspects that we're going to be going into in the future on what's going on in our environment of our pot, but that's a discussion we're actually going to save for the fertilization discussion, um, just because there's a huge component as to what we're trying to create with our microbial activity inside that containerized environment. So when we're talking about soil choices for our bonsai, we're going to keep revisiting that concept of oxygen and water balance. But then in application, we also need to discuss, is my soil choice going to maintain the right oxygen water balance for that specific species of tree? And is that soil choice then going to maintain the right oxygen water balance for that species of tree in the external environment for which I live? So a full sun environment in Texas is very different than a full sun environment in northern Wisconsin. It's as we move closer to the equator or farther away, those rays become more intense. If you live in a very dry climate versus a very wet climate, those are all considerations that you need to apply to your own situation. So that's my hope is when you understand then that tree species and the different components of soil that we could put together, you can then make those educated decisions quite accurately as to what type of mix you need to put in your pot. Um, so a water loving species that's being repotted in Texas, you're going to have to treat that quite a bit different in your soil choice than if I have a water loving species in Northern Wisconsin. And we need to then understand all the different components that we have to create our soil mixes. And that's when we can choose and fully understand and put that together. So when you sit back and examine that external environment and the conditions that you need to keep in mind, we're going to move through the different types of soil strips, substrates. Um, the other component that you're gonna to have to think about is your watering frequency. Are you someone who's heavy handed with the watering can and do you like to go out and frequently water those trees? Um, if you're a beginner, most of the time when we're seeing um, trees die from inappropriate watering techniques, they're going to be overwatered. It's very rare that we have someone that underwaters a tree and it dies, unless they decided to leave on holiday or vacation for a few weeks and didn't have anyone watch their tree and they left it outside in the sun. So revisiting that Texas versus Wisconsin analogy, if you're only going to definitively be able to commit to watering once a day, that's going to change what composition you want. You're going to need more water holding capacity and more of a buffer if you have trees in the hot sun of Texas. Um, so let's go ahead and dive right away now into those different soil substrates that we have available when we're potentially putting together our mixes. Now, the most common soil mix that we're going to primarily see is what we call that APL mix. And that's usually the basic is going to be a one to one to one ratio. So when we're talking about APL, we're talking about our Akadama, our pumice and our lava rock. And with the lava rock, we can see both red lava rock and black lava rock. Um, there's not a huge difference whether you get the one color or the other color um, when we're really talking about the pot environment. <clears throat> All right, so let's jump into the Akadama now. So the Akadama is our substrate that really helps create those fine feeder roots. While it does hold some um, nutrients and moisture in the little pockets, that's not the main reason why we put that in our mix. 
um, the Akadama is going to be that particle that breaks down in our pot. So after we had had this discussion before, one of the good questions that I had received through a PM is, if the Akadama is what is breaking down in our pots and creating water problems where it's staying wet too long, why is Akadama considered a gold standard in our um, pot environments? Why are we using it if it breaks down and it can cause that issue? And that's because the Akadama is doing exactly what it's supposed to. So when we do a repot due to the decomposition of the Akadama um, and replace that, the Akadama we actually want breaking down. So if you think about as we're trying to create um, fine feeder roots, the ramification in our root structures, how the Akadama helps do that is as you have your Akadama pot, you know, little pellet piece, and that root starts to go through, try to go through it or around it, and it gives it a little squeeze, you get these little micro explosions in your pot. So as that splits, and these are now smaller pieces, it cues those roots then to send out finer roots and they split also. And then they have these finer particles now that as it approaches it and it, and that's a process that just repeats itself. So the Akadama is an extremely important component, especially when we are have moved through our growth and development stages in our pre-bonsai. And we're starting now to look at the ramification in our canopy. And we know then that the roots are a direct reflection of what we see going on above the tree. So developing highly ramified roots helps us develop those highly ramified fine branch structures when we're talking about our tertiary branches up in the canopy. Now, if you still have a tree in early growth and development and you're really trying to still develop your primary structure, thicken your trunk, develop those secondary branches, it's not going to be as an important component at that point in that tree's development. So you do with your trees that are in growth development, have some additional choices that you can use if you don't want to expend that cost on doing a basic APL type mix. Um, <coughs> sorry, I'm getting a little bit of, I don't know, could be Omicron. So when we talk then about the pumice, the pumice's job inside the pot is going to specifically um, be related to the water retention. So if we think of our pumice as a very hard, firm sponge, it's not only going to hold the moisture in our containerized environment, but as the environment around those pumice pieces starts to dry, evaporate, the tree has taken up that water, the pumice is actually very good at then releasing the water that's holding back into that surrounding environment. It doesn't break down generally, and it holds its shape. Um, I don't want to say it never breaks down, because if you're going to leave an APL mix in a pot for... 10 years, you're going to see some degrading of all of that material. But as a whole, the pumice does not break down, so it retains the water content in that mix. So, quick review. We have the Akadama in that APL mix. The Akadama is to help create those fine feeder roots, and its job is to break down as it comes into contact with those roots and they start to grow through it or around it. The pumice, that is our water retaining, holding piece in our soil. So then we get to the lava rock. Now the lava rock can hold some as it has some pores and divots in it, um, but its main job is to maintain that oxygen flow throughout the pot. It doesn't break down, it doesn't hold and release as much water as our pumice does. So when we're talking about lava rock, that's to create those oxygen spaces and that oxygen flow throughout our roots so we can maintain that oxygen water then balance. Um, so Akadama, breaks down, creates those fine feeder roots. Pumice doesn't break down very easily, holds water, releases it back to the tree as the environment around it dries. And lava rock, it holds some, but its main job is maintaining those air spaces for that oxygen flow. So that's why the APL is really that standard gold mix. You have a part of that soil that's fulfilling each of those intended jobs. Um, now, as bonsai as a whole is growing worldwide and as we're getting less availability to import these volcanic rocks, rock substances that we use, we're going to have to start looking to see what do we have available in the United States, in North America, in South America, wherever you're from, in Europe, that can replace those jobs. Because um, it needs to be able to do what that particle was intended to do. 
Now we have some good available um, items that we can use in the U.S. that are a lot more cost effective for holding and maintaining moisture and for oxygenation in the soil. What we have not been able to find or replicate is that Akadama. Um, and we're seeing those prices soar. We're seeing that they're sold out, especially as we go into potting season. So if you're going to go with an APL mix, um, it's going to be a lot easier to buy those components separate. And many clubs do like these mass purchases that you can get on. So I fully recommend doing that. Um, if you only have one or two trees and it's $50 for a bag of the APL mix and they're smaller bags, um, it might not be as big a deal for you. But if you have some of the people that are growing and developing bonsai and they have a hundred trees, they do need to start looking at the cost effectiveness and how they're going to get these items. Um, try to get your APL not during that peak potting season and approaching potting season um, because we're going to have an increased supply and demand issue at that time. It's much easier to find APL, especially through your commercialized like Superfly Bonsai um, outside of that repotting season. If you go to their site right now, just about everything that they have is going to be sold out. I know because I looked because I needed to get some extra pumice. So I had to go elsewhere to find that. Um, now, one of the other Japanese substrates that we do use commonly that's very different and it's got its own unique niche is going to be Kanuma. So Nakuma, Kanuma is another type of substrate that they have um, found harvested in Japan. And it's a very powdery, airy, light substrate. Kanuma, we're going to use 100% in our acid loving species to maintain what their pH environment is. Kanuma naturally carries a 5.5 pH. So if we have azaleas in our collection, camellias, and even um, gardenias in our collection, we're going to want to repot them into 100% kanuma. And one of the first spring repots we're going to be doing this year is with an azalea because azalea has some very specific nuances when we're talking about how we're going to handle their roots in a repot for the health. Because um, if we mishandle the azalea during those repots, um, they, suff they suffer and they have a hard time really bouncing back. Um, and a lot of times it's going to take a full season for them to recover. Um, so that's one of the pots, what's one of the trees that we're going to be repotting um, after we get through this lecture series. And my canuma then arrives. Um, so before we jump into then those other substrates that we do have available in North America quite readily and easily, and start talking about other components that we can add in. I want us to start thinking about what this knowledge that we just learned, this very basic knowledge of the parts of a the soil in a containerized environment and what that means to you and apply it. So everybody loved those word problems back in math class, so very similar to that. So if we're talking about what we're going to make as our soil substrates, again, we need to maintain that oxygen water balance we need to maintain that oxygen water balance for that specific tree species. And we need to maintain that oxygen water balance for that tree species within our environment. So this is where you can start thinking applying because now you have that knowledge base as to what they do. So if we're taking into consideration also then our ability to water, and let's say we have a ponderosa pine or even a Kishu juniper, um, maybe you have a Portulacara afra, these are species that really prefer a drier container environment. They are species that they don't want wet feet and they don't want to sit in water very long. Um, so if we're talking about that one to one to one ratio being a standard mix, um, I live in northern Wisconsin. I can monitor my trees at least daily and I know I can water my trees generally at least once a day. Um, that one to one to one ratio is probably going to be just fine for my Kishus and Ponderosa Pines um, and even my Portulacara Afras. But if we change that variable just a little, now a one to one to one ratio is probably not gonna be okay for that tree. So if we take that tree species that likes that drier containerized environment and we're going to now have it be living in Seattle. What do we know about Seattle? We know Seattle has very wet growing seasons. They have higher humidity levels. They have very long stretches. So we're gonna to wanna to pick a soil substrate that's not going to 
allow a lot of water accumulation and holding in that pot. Um, so even if it waters every day for a month, as long as that water is freely flowing through that containerized environment, those species aren't going to get as upset as if we're overwatering and have more hold, water holding capacity and frequency of watering. Um, so if we're going to go repot a species that likes those drier containerized environments in these wet external environments, um, what are we going to need? Are we going to need more fine feed of roots? Well, that doesn't, doesn't make sense. So we're probably not going to change the Akadama part very much. Pumice? If we're in a wet environment with a tree that likes dry stuff, are we going to need a lot more pumice? Are we going to need to change the water holding capacity and hold more water? Nope. Nope. We have a continuous frequent flow of water through that pot. We are not going to need to change our pumice. What do we need to do? We need to increase the oxygenation through the roots and make sure that it is freely draining. What substance does that? The lava rock. So if you have a ponderosa pine or a kishu juniper and you're in Seattle, you might want to step that up to a 1-1-2 ratio and increase then your lava rock in that containerized environment. Um, now, if you're able to give it some break from the rain, then maybe you just want to stick everything in a 1-1-1 ratio. But again, that's something that you're going to have to act accordingly to with raising a species in that environment. Um, so then let's flip it up again and let's go ahead and let's say it's a ponderosa pine now and we're in the heart of Texas. Um, very dry, very hot. Um, mm, it's probably going to need a little bit of shade cloth because those sun rays are a little bit intense for the ponderosa pine. But if we're talking specifically about what we're going to put in that container, we know in that heat in that environment, those containers are going to dry out very quickly. So they might be just fine then actually, maybe they're going to increase their pumice, especially if they're not able to monitor that pot throughout the day. And as those heat and those temperatures rise in the afternoon, um, they can change that up a little bit with decreasing the intensity of the sun rays by providing some additional sun cloth, especially during the afternoon. And that's going to help retain some of that moisture in that pot. So I hope the dots are starting to connect a little. It's not that complicated as long as you know what each piece does and then you know what your species likes and then you can reflect that on the environment and your watering capabilities. So if we change now that variable to a different tree species, um, let's say we're repotting a very water loving tree, like a willow variety or a bald cypress, um, commonly called a swamp cypress for a reason, or even a dawn redwood. Um, these are tree species that the water oxygen balance for that species, they like a higher water content in their containerized and a lot more water holding capacity. So up here in Northern Wisconsin, a good ratio that I like to do then is a one to one. Again, I don't need any more fine feeder roots at this point in my growth and development of my tree. Pumice, it's my whole water holding capacity, increases the moisture content available to readily give it back to the tree. Lava rock increases the oxygenation. We have fairly mild summers. We don't generally get very extreme heats. Um, our sun is out there, but it's nothing compared to the sun in some of the southern states of the United States. So I might go with a one, two, one, or I might even choose then to order, to add into my standard APL one to one to one ratio, something that's organic. And we'll start talking about some of those, the organic additives that we can do. Um, if you're gonna add an organic material, or if you receive a tree from a commercial buyer that's primarily in organic material, you need to understand that organic material holds a lot more moisture. Um, we've, we've seen that, it can create just a, mucky, muddy, condensed, hard, heavy pot because it, the organic material on its own generally doesn't hold enough spaces for the oxygen flow through it. Um, so I might do a 50% fine pine bark or a 50% peat and a 50% of a one-to-one -one mix. Um, we can also then change and increase more oxygen flow through that if we're going with a higher organic content by changing actually the pot itself. Um, pond baskets, aeration baskets, those are things that have become very popular in bonsai culture um, these last few years here in North America. 
because it helps increase that oxygen flow, but we still need to then have oxygen channels within that soil. So then that oxygen that's hitting that outside part of the basket has places to go. Um, so if we take that bald cypress water loving tree and we're gonna stick it in Seattle, he's probably just fine there with his frequent long stretches of rain with just keeping with that standard one to one to one mix. Um, now, if we take that same water loving tree again and we stick it down in Texas where it's very, very dry, um, that is going to need a lot more changes to that soilized environment that someone in Texas would create for a water loving species. They might wind up going with a very high organic mix that we know is going to hold water. Um, they might have an APL mix and then stick it in a shallow container of water so just the bottom is able to uptake it um, or even combine that by using an organic material as their soil and very shallow water so that it can reabsorb up into those rooting systems. Um, they're not as prone to root rots because that tree is designed in a water loving environment. I'm not a big fan of keeping them submerged in water though because we do see problems with that and it does decrease the longevity of those trees if we keep them completely saturated, especially if we're not changing out that water. Um, because when we talk about putting that water loving tree in a pot and then submerging it in water, if we're not changing that water out, that stagnant water is very, very different than that water and that microbial environment that it then lives in out in the natural environment. It doesn't have those same um, microbes that are continuously um, cleaning up the debris and other things so we can get some nasty diseases introduced to our tree if we're not being careful with that. Um, so now our trees are still very much mainly going to be in the growth and development stage. So if we're working with trees in the growth and development stage, then it's less important to have that Akadama component into it. Um, and we are able to actually use some less expensive um, products into our soil mixes that we can um, adjust needed for that tree species and our environment. Um, and when we're talking about growth and development, your tree is in growth and development if you're still trying to thicken the trunk, grow the trunk, and establish those secondary branches. Um, one of the biggest setbacks, and we'll talk about this more when we get into like the growth of a tree and the actual developing of a tree, that people do is they get a little pre-bonsai, they've gotten it from a commercial seller, it came in a three inch by three inch by one and a half inch depth pot and keeping it in there. When we down pot and we start using these smaller, shallower, tiny pots, again, that's going to be a tree primarily that we have put into the ramp, that we're now at the ramification stage. We can, you can certainly develop a tree in a smaller pot with shallower substrate in that pot, but that is going to slow down the growth of your tree. And when we get into the ramification stage of a tree, we want slower growth because we want to be able to handle and really direct that energy. We don't want things getting real big. Um, and we're trying to work on creating then those smaller tertiary st structures and the finer branching up in the canopy. So we want to take back that energy and that growth and not have as a vigorous growing tree. Um, and we can, you know, change that up a little bit when we start talking about fertilizers also. Uh, but growth and development, your tree's gonna be a little better if you can stick it into a bigger pot, but it also has to be in relation to that root size and that tree size. Because if you take an itty bitty little tree and you stick it in this massive 20 gallon pot, it's still actually not going to grow as fast as if, let's say you put it into a, you know, a two gallon grow bucket because to increase the growth through our roots, which then increases all that energy going up into the tree, it needs an addition, it needs a warmer environment in which to produce those roots. So when you put the little tree with smaller roots into this massive grow pot that's way too big for it, um, it doesn't get that heat and that warmth to where those roots currently are. Um, so it's actually not going to grow as fast as if you actually put it in an appropriate size container. Um, some people also put their trees in the ground. That's fine. I don't like putting my trees in the ground um, after they've been in a potted environment because I don't want the roots to get completely out of control. I still want to be able to manage 
that goes. And I feel like it's easier to do that if I have it in a containerized environment. Um, I do have trees I'm developing that are currently in the ground, but it's because they haven't yet came out of the ground. And I've done some, doing some experiments out in the field, out on our land with them. Um, things like our red oak trees. I've done some pretty aggressive hard cutbacks. I wanna see how they come back without having to think about the roots inability to support the structural experiments I'm doing. Um, I've done some leaf defoliations in some of the um, native oak trees outside to see how small I can get those leaves, understanding too that once they're in a containerized environment, we'll probably be able to reduce that leaf size quite a bit more. But I wanted to do these experiments with these native species that we don't have a lot of information on that are available around me while those roots are still in the ground so they can support whatever hard work I'm doing above that. Um, so that's some information that I'm sure I'll hit on through these coming years. I do have a couple of those oaks that I'm gonna actually be taking out of the ground this year and start to introduce them into pot life and see how things go. Um, <coughs> so our focus is always gonna be on creating the healthy roots, maintaining that oxygen water balance. And so if we're going to use a non-APL mix then we still need to balance that oxygen water in that tank for that species for our environment. So as we increase the organic matter in our pot, we are going to increase that water holding capacity in the pot. And if you're using organic matter in a shallow pot, there's less gravitational pull to pull that water through. So that's another thing you have to be very careful of. Um, those more shallow pots are actually gonna stay, stay wetter than if you have a taller cascade pot because a cascade pot has that gravitational pull that's gonna pull that water down through. Um, and that we will talk about some watering basics too. It seems so easy, but a bonsai apprentice in Japan it spends the first three years of their apprenticeship learning how to water. Um, so if that doesn't tell us that, that's an important part of the bonsai culture and developing it, then I don't know what does. Um, so, in the beginner groups, we see a lot of people that they've recently purchased a little bonsai. It got shipped to them from a commercial seller that runs a mass-produced bonsai grow, you know, grow house. And they'll post a picture saying, oh my God, what's wrong with my tree? Because they have all these leaves yellowing, dropping. Um, maybe they have some brown discoloration, some black discoloration on those leaves before they drop. And everybody starts telling them they need to repot that tree. It needs to get into APL. Um, but nobody is ever addressing that there's not necessarily a wrong soil type. It's that you have to adjust how you're watering that tree based on the soil type. Um, so there's a lot of blame placed on the soil as the culprit instead of the person that's watering the tree. So just one other thing to keep in mind. Now, if we're talking about our potting soils that we have available, we have like are very, very cheap substrates. Um, you can go to a Dollar General store, a Walmart, get a really cheap $4, $5 bag of potting soil. I don't recommend that, but if that's what you have, that's what you wanna do, then feel free as long as you're keeping in mind that you're gonna to need to add some extra components to that soil to increase the oxygenation and that drainage and that water flow through the soil. Um, we have some amazing potting soil mixes that are available in North America now. Ones that are rich with nutrients that really can help feed our growing and developing young bonsais and our pre-bonsais when we're in those initial stages of developing that trunk and those secondary branches. Um, so one of my favorite soil makers is um, going to be our Fox Farm brands. Um, they have a Happy, Happy Frogs, I know it's got a cute little name, but both Ocean Forest and Happy Frogs are full full of nutrient rich material in that soil. Um, that's a soil mix that I put a lot of my young dawn redwoods in and my water loving species because when you have a water loving species, they generally also usually like a super high organic content due to that nutritional impact. So that's a brand that it's expensive, but I guarantee it is well worth that cost. Um, 25 27 dollars for a bag um, but we are talking a 50 pound bag so it's a good size and especially if we're going to cut that with something that's going to aerate and allow for better drainage um, but they're full of earthworm casings 
fish emulsions. I mean, this is like nutrient packed potting soil. So especially my young cuttings that root very well in water, that's a soil that I actually, once I've transitioned them from propagating in water into a soil, I will put them in 100% of this mix and keep it very wet because it's trying to transition to dirt life. So we can't just go ahead and stick it in something that dries out frequently until those roots have established in that. And then we might pot it up later in the season and add some more aeration mix into that. Um, so shredded pine bark, that's another thing that we're gonna see, especially in some of our pines and our conifers. Um, the thing with, if you're gonna go with a shredded pine bark, you do need to watch your watering with the shredded pine bark a bit more, because it can be very deceiving. Because when shredded pine bark dries, it actually is going to need to be heavily watered to reabsorb that water. Um, so what we see is if there's a high amount of that pine bark you give it water, it looks like it's wet. It is actually maybe just wet on the edges, but it hasn't had the ability to actually pull up and absorb that water. And it can very falsely give the sense that you have completely watered that tree and it's not, it's still actually quite dry. Um, especially if you're going to buy some of those tropical species from some of the nurseries. Um, I know when I, my Brazilian rain tree that we are going to repot here shortly also, um, that one's in near 100% pine bark. So I really need to go through and fully saturate that one once it has dried, um, just to maintain that moisturized environment then. Um, perlite, if we're gonna be adding oxygen and needing increased drainage, perlite is going to be our item that we may choose to add into if we're not going to be using pumice to add that oxygenation. So if we have a tree in growth and development, we're going to use a highly, we're choosing to use a highly organic soil. Um, those organic soil mixes generally don't have enough of the components to maintain that oxygen balance in them, unless it's one of those super water loving species. So you're going to choose, are you gonna go out and buy some straight up pumice and use, or sorry, straight up lava rock and use that instead? or are you going to go out and buy a bunch of perlite? So perlite is kind of that styrofoamy looking ball. Um, I would recommend going with a higher grain size of the perlite because um, that'll just help to hold more oxygen space in that pot. Um, and you then might decide to go with a 50% of one of the organic soil mixes that are nutrient rich and 50% of your perlite and mix them together. Um, if you, and you can test, you can test to see how, what your water and oxygen holding capacity is. So if you take your little container and you're gonna mix a little bit of the potting soil in and do the ratio with your um, perlite, and I want you to thoroughly water it, thoroughly saturate your mixture, pick up a handful of that, give it some good squeezes. If you give it some good squeezes and then you open up your, you know, your hand and it's actually quite fallen apart, then you probably have a good balance of that oxygen moving, maintaining um, perlite and your organic soil matter. If you pick it up and you squeeze it and you open it up and you have a ball of soil, muck, um, you're probably gonna wanna add some more of that oxygen maintaining airspace product. So whether that's going to be then the lava rock or your perlite. Um, sand is another component that we add in. I don't like to routinely add sand into any of my trees with the very exception that if I have um, young maples that I have recently harvested and brought in from and collected them, maple trees grow very well in sand. Now, if we were gonna go out and take a walk in a couple hundred acres out here, where we get most of our maples actually growing and cultivating isn't in all the dirt and everything else that's out in the land. We have a old, large sand arena that um, my oldest daughter and my middle daughter, but my oldest daughter used it to ride horses when she was younger. So we had filled this and flattened this big area with sand. And that is where all of those maple saplings just grow, just pop up. Um, so looking, identifying, we have maple trees all over. We do maple syrup here, um, but that's where our maple trees most readily grow. So when I do collect them, then I will put them for that first growing season in a higher content of just sand. 
to mimic where I have seen them naturally growing and growing more vigorously and maintaining them. Um, I'm trying to think if I'm missing anything else. I, I don't think so. So let's go ahead and let's look at some of those APL mixes. Um, so if we're going to be talking the APL mix, this is a, has been recently watered, um, but this is what our standard APL mix is going to look like. Um, and this is a one-to-one -one ratio. This is a small ivy forest that I put together this year. Um, when we get our APL, it's generally going to look like this. It's very, very dusty. This has not been sifted out yet. So you're going to either want to make sure that you buy sifted APL substrate so we're not getting all that dust and all that material that's already broken down in our tree, or you're going to want to buy a sifter grate, which I highly recommend. Because um, we use that not only for sifting our soils, but we're actually going to use it also when we talk about um, how to create a the environmental mossing that's actually healthy for our trees on top. Um, so it's a metal sifter is going to help you with sifting these particles as you purchase them. And also that's what we're going to use then to grate our um, moss down, grate our sphagnum, and create that mixture to top dress our trees with. Um, this is a slightly larger this is already sifted but I didn't take out and mix up the particle sizes yet um, and particle sizes do matter so if we are talking about a smaller grain of particle we're going to want that with a smaller tree um, and the larger grains we're going to reserve for the larger trees um, so as you can see this is a lot finer than this mix here. And there's a reason for that. And when we actually get into doing our repots, we're gonna talk about um, the different grain sizes and why we would choose one grain size over the other and why we also do maybe a larger grain size in the bottom of our pots before we add in our like little shoheen size grains. But all right, so I think that's it for today. Thanks for coming. Thanks for jumping on my lecture. Um, don't worry, at some point we will get into working with trees, but there are a billion videos out there that show people working with their trees. And I want to give you those principles, those concepts, and that knowledge base so that you can independently work with your trees and make those educated decisions for your trees because you can fully understand all the different aspects that go into raising and growing the bonsai. Um, all right, if you have any questions, drop them down in the comments. If you have some more ideas, um, go ahead and stick them down there. <laughs> Before we actually start getting into our repots, we're probably going to talk also about the fertilization component. Um, and that's going to be a big lecture because we're going to be really diving into the microbiology of what's going on in our pots and why we are going to choose one fertilizer over the other, how we're going to apply that fertilizer, um, and how we're going to then apply it in relation to what stage our tree is in. So, Hope you guys have a great day. Enjoy your Monday. Hope you have a beautiful week. Um, and I am going to sign out now. So thanks for coming on the last Bonsai Science Lecture.